All right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I did a piece on the social contract uh, during the pandemic, and I think there's some fascinating developments just coming down the pipe at us that will um, kind of bring the question of the social contract into context. Several people uh, commented in, in response to the last um, to that concept of the social contract, saying, "Look, the workers are exploited. They work too much. They don't get paid enough. You know, et cetera, et cetera. There is no social contract." But uh, I think that's a misunderstanding. The, what the social contract is is the notion, however ephemeral, um, that I am being exploited, and yet I still go along with the system because I feel there's something there that will come back to me that there's this agreement um, it's usually ill-defined and unspecified, and yet this is why things work. And as I mentioned, the notion that, uh, you know, we've basically shut down the country to try and protect the, the health of, of many of our vulnerable citizens and that we're burning the economy to the ground doing that is sort of an impressive change from, from history, but it also tells us that politicians feel that they have to do this. You know, no one wants to do this. It's just like they go, oh, you know, our, our concept is that if we don't help the people in this way, then we're, you know, there's going to be problems. And so both the interest of life and also the interest in remaining in your position of power means that their understanding of the social contract is they have to do this. <clears throat> now, what's interesting to me as we move forward is we're, we're going to hit some divergent points. <clears throat> and the first one, I think, is going to come. It's April 1st. You're already seeing noise about this and that everybody, you know, lots of mortgages, lots of people's rent are due on the first of the month. And so, well, can you do that? Well, unemployment absolutely blew through the roof, of course, obviously, lots and lots and lots of people can't work. So they don't have money to pay the rent or to pay their mortgage. Now, what happens in this case? Several major corporations, Subway, Cheesecake Factory, a couple other ones, uh, have announced that they're not going to pay, that they're going to either negotiate with their uh, landlords or they're going to invoke various legal strategies to say they're not responsible for paying at a time when the government has shut them down, force majeure, a couple other ideas. But So the idea here is they're going, look, we know we have a contract to pay, but in these circumstances, we don't think we either can or that we should. But anyway, we're not going to. So lots and lots of individual people are also facing this problem. And so banks are starting to roll out programs and you're being able to apply and so on and so forth. Well, this is great, but it's also nonsensical. The problem here, and this is where the social contract comes in, is if enough people say, look, I can't pay or I'm worried about having money in the future, even if I could pay this month, I don't know about next month, I don't know about a month after that, I'm not going to pay. This, of course, will stress the financial system, you know, ex extraordinarily. And in fact, already the Fed has put, un well, they just said unlimited money. The, the mortgage bond market, all these have been seizing up. The credit markets have been seizing up and the Fed's been pumping, pumping money and pumping money in. So essentially what the government has decided is that they will back the banks who hold these mortgages, but they haven't announced that they're going to back the people who pay them. Now, this is a divergence. The federal government has said we don't want our banks to fail, but individual people who are paying, they haven't actually come out with a comprehensive program for that. Now, they've announced various stopgap things, call your mortgage broker, all this. Well, that's, that's fine, but that's just not what we need, right? That's not going to solve the problem. And where this becomes a social contract issue is if enough people say no, I either can't or I just am afraid to, I think it's a bad idea, then now you've got a problem. Does the government say, hey, no one's going to be evicted for 60 days, but at the end of 60 days, we're just going to start evicting all these people who didn't pay? Wow, think of what that would mean. Or does the government have to step in retroactively <clears throat> and go, right, of course you don't have to pay. We're going to pass this program. It's going to be 90 days or 180 days where no one has to pay the rent or their mortgage, and then the Fed will backfill that money to the borrowers, the lenders, the landowners, the leaseholders, and then everything is good. See, then we have a contract again. So you're actually, how this dynamic plays out, I think is going to be fascinating. So, so look for this, because if enough people don't pay, even if the, if, if the government doesn't want to, they don't have a choice. 
either the system at that point would break down completely, no matter how much money they put into the uh, banks, it wouldn't matter. Or the government decides to come to agreement and to say, hey, we're going to put out this really big, massive program that everybody can participate in. So far, they haven't done that. They've been behind the curve, obviously. And you may know that the Senate decided to take a month-long break, which I think is hilarious and unlikely that they're going to get that month off, um, I would suggest. But we'll see. You never know. So that's going to be one metric here that you're going to be able to look at and see if people decide spontaneously and collectively that they both can't and they shouldn't and they won't, both businesses and individuals, then the old form of leasing and renting, right, that actually stops working. It's a legal arrangement, but it only works because 98% of the time everybody agrees to it and we all go along. But if one person doesn't pay their rent, you can kick them out. If 50% of the population doesn't pay their rent or, or their mortgage, your, your old, you, all that legal documents just goes out the window. It doesn't matter anymore because the system, the old uh, communal understanding of how we do this has frozen and then you have to unfreeze it. So I'll, I'll be interested in the next week or two to see how that plays out because it will put a real strain on one of the, the core elements here. A second one is notice that almost all of the lockdown, as I mentioned before, this is voluntary. Most of the country is now under lockdown or business restrictions. Um, and so governors, mayors are just coming out and asking people, hey, please stay home. Don't go to big gatherings, you know. And people are, but you know, of course, exceptions again, but by and large, people are playing along. So we've, again, this is social agreement. The police aren't out shooting people. Um, I, don't, I haven't heard of mass arrests. I haven't seen, you know, riots around this. So it is sort of a, a, an agreement. Ah, at what point, if one government entity says one thing and another government entity says another, now what happens? So if the federal government, for some reason, says, you know, they talk about Easter, which is, of course, uh, hilarious. But anyway, if they really go for that, if they say, okay, that's it, no more lockdowns at Easter, but then the governors say, no, 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 we're going to stay locked down because it's not safe yet, ah, now what happens? This is where it gets really interesting, right? When the, you get the divergent messages and divergent instructions then, you know, what happens? And if 40% of the population decides, okay, we'll go with what the feds say, then your entire, the, the, the whole cohesion is gone, right? Everything that had been accomplished up until that time just explodes. And so that is another interesting potential stress point is to see what happens if, if this is just an if, I'm not saying this will happen, I'm just saying this is an if, what, what happens if you start getting these divergent sort of, um, instructions or, or, or orders, because again, this all has to be voluntary. This is all voluntary, essentially. They can, you can enforce a little bit, but you can't enforce very much in a country that's this big and this diverse. And so it will be fascinating to see. So again, the, the social contract is the communal agreement about how things happen, why we do things, the way we do things. And 95% of the time, most people go along with this. And we may not like it. We may say, oh, yeah, look, these workers are being exploited. They don't make enough. And we're going to, you know, lobby and argue for that. But we don't stop the system. When the social contract is frayed or when you get revolutions is when for some reason, whatever, something causes one of those fundamental agreements that lots of people feel spontaneously, usually, that the deal is broken. And when that happens, then stuff gets crazy. So we don't want that to happen because, you know, Revolutions tend to be messy and destructive, but uh, stay tuned. We will find out in about a week or two weeks what happens on the April 1st mortgage and rent and lease payment schedule. If it's really catastrophically bad, which it very well could be, in fact, I don't see why it wouldn't be, then you're going to see the Fed, federal government's going to have to come in and come up with another plan, some other strategy to, to deal with this. So um, just two different stressors that are coming that I think you can watch when you ponder the social contract. Um, and finally, to finish on this thought, think of this even outside, right? So if you look at revolutions that have broken systems in the past, uh, they really do revolve often. Once you get to the near modern age, it's important to note that in the ancient world, uh, the social contract was between the elites. 
And so and I don't know if that's, it's a very different sort of arrangement, but there might be a thousand people who matter, but you had to make those thousand people relatively happy or they would overthrow you or kill you or, you know, revolution. So this happens continuously, or it might just be the palace, right? You have four brothers and they're always killing each other in the ancient world because one of them wants to rule. So you got to keep the brothers happy, but far away, or you just kill them when they're young or something like this. But in, in once you get to say, oh, you know, I don't know, the 1600s, 1700s, you get these larger political forces and the people begin to matter in mass. And so you have to come up with ways to sort of address their needs uh, and make sure that they feel like even if there's exploitation, even if they're suffering, there's still something enough in it for them that they don't want to see the whole thing burned down. And usually people are very conservative. They don't want to see the whole thing burned down. But when we face now something so unprecedented, um, what you're, you're, you're beginning to witness is this sense of, wow, things are changing fast. Will people abandon going just because they have to or because of fear that, you know, wait, we're just not going to pay our leases, our rents, and our mortgages. And that brings the system to a halt because one of the fundamental agreements is gone. So look for those stressors. Uh, and see how the social dynamic around that goes. Because I think, um, again, that the response of the people will probably drive the government to action. Thank you.